if God has spoken, there is nothing more important than to listen to what he says and to respond to his word, was a quote by Dr. Toussaint about Psalm 19. You know, God has spoken in many portions and in many ways, as Hebrews says, but in the last days, he has spoken to us in his son, Jesus Christ. But God continues to speak in other ways as well. He continues to speak in the skies, in the creation of all the world. He continues to speak to us whenever we look into his written word. You know, the truth is, many times in our lives, we get caught up with all of the hustle and bustle of everything that's going on in life, and we don't do, as the saying says, take time to stop and smell the roses, to stop and see the glory that is seen of God in the skies, to see the work of His hands, to understand that God is in control of all situations. We don't stop and take the time the time to get into His Word and see the beauty and His glory and the work of His hands in His Word. But that is what God calls us to do. God continues to speak, not only in the skies, but in His Word. And that's what we're going to see this morning. So if God has spoken, there is nothing more important than to listen to what He says and to respond to His Word. So let's begin by looking at an outline of what we're going to see this morning. First, we're going to see in Revelation, or in Psalm uh, 19, verses 1 through 6, we're going to see the revelation of God in the sky. And then in verses 7 through 11, we're going to see the revelation of God as it's seen in the Scripture. And then finally, we're going to see the response to the revelation in verses 12 through 14. We're going to see David's response, which should be our response as well. We're going to see it's for purification for prevention, and for perfection. So this morning, we're only going to have time to scratch the surface of this amazing psalm written by David. But hopefully, as we scratch the surface, it will entice you to go back and to see all the information that is in this one chapter of God's Word. We see so much revelation of God in His Word in this chapter alone. In five of these verses, it's packed full of information about God and its benefits for us. And so as we scratch the surface, hopefully it will entice you to go home and to dig it on a deeper level. So let's begin by looking at verse 1. It says, The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of His hand. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. So in the first two verses, we see that God continues to reveal Himself. Notice what it says there. It says the heavens are telling and their expanse is declaring. It's a continuous thing. Day to day pours forth speech. Day to day we can see God's glory as we look up and see the sunrise and the many colors that are displayed there. We can see the glory of God whenever we see those clouds move across the sky. We can see God's glory as He has the dark clouds that bring forth rain. We can see the glory of God in the day. But night to night, it reveals knowledge. It reveals knowledge about who God is and that God is in control. As you look out into the vastness of the sky, as you look out into its expanse, you can see that there is something that is greater than this world. There is something that is holding everything in its place. Think about this. There are stars that are 10 billion light years away. And they use these high-powered telescopes to look at those stars. But really, they're looking back in time because they're not seeing where those stars are today. They're seeing where they were 10 billion years because it takes 10 billion light years to get that light to us. Think about how vast and how the expanse of God's creation is, how He holds the universe in place, how He's placed those stars in the sky and He knows them by name. What an amazing God. But even more, He cares for us. Those whom He created in His own image. Those whom He sent His one and only Son to die in our place. 
What a great and amazing God we have. Look on in verse 3. It says, There are no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth and their utterances to the end of the world. You see, it's universal. It's universal. It doesn't speak a specific language. People all over the world can see that God exists when they look into the expanse of the sky. They can see the work of His hands. They can see His glory. Romans 1.20 goes on to say, For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power, and His divine nature have been seen through what has been made, so that people are without excuse. You know, the truth is, there are many astrologers and many scientists who want to say that there is no God. They want to say that a big bang happened and there's all of these laws of physics and science that holds everything into place, that there is no God. But they are without excuse whenever they look into the vastness of the sky. Whenever they look in their microscopes and they see those small molecules and how they all hold into place. They are without excuse. You know, you even think about the early astrologers, those wise men. What did God use to lead them to the Savior. As my daughter says, twinkle, twinkle, little star. How I wonder what you are. It was the star that led those wise men to that baby or to that child that was there in Bethlehem, who was the Son, the Savior of the world. God is in control of all things. Look on with me at verse 4. It says, In them He has placed a tent for the sun. We see that God is in control. He placed a tent for the sun. Just as He is in control and places the sun at just the right point in time, He sent His Son, the Savior, into the world. Notice on with me at verse 5, continuing to talk about the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of His chamber. Notice here that it doesn't talk about the bride. I think we've got it all mixed up here in this world. You know, it's all about the bride. The bride has to go and get her hair all done. It's the bride who gets the dress. It's the bride who makes the grand entrance. But whenever we look into the Word of God, it's all about the bridegroom, Jesus Christ. He is what? It's all about. It's all about the bridegroom. He's coming back to get his bride. Us, the church, who have put our faith in Jesus Christ. He's coming back in the clouds to take us up to be with him for all eternity. It is at the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's all about the bridegroom, Jesus Christ. The central focus of the Bible is Jesus Christ. The Old Testament looks forward to the coming of the Messiah, the Savior. The New Testament looks back for our hope, for our eternal salvation in that first coming of the Messiah, the Savior, Jesus Christ. There is also a truth that's found in the Bible that Jesus Christ is coming again. He's coming again in the clouds to take His church away, to take the bride of Christ away. But the question is, Are you ready? If you're sitting here today and you don't know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if Jesus Christ were to come back today, if He would take you to be with Him, you can know for sure. Because the Bible says that Jesus Christ left the glories of heaven, He became a man, and He lived a perfect life. He died on a cross paying for your sins, for my sins, for the sins of the entire world. He arose from the grave conquering death. And so He can give you life as a gift. If you simply believe in Him, you have everlasting life. Are you ready for the next coming of Christ? Look on with me to the end of verse 5, continuing to talk about the sun. It says, It rejoices as a strong man to run his course. Its rising is from one end of the heavens, and its circuit to the other end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. God is in control. Everything takes its command from the Lord. Just as we know that the sun will come out tomorrow, we can know at the proper time that God will send forth His Son to take us, the church, the bride of Christ, away. There is no hiding from the sun's heat. It's universal as well. The sun's heat can be seen and felt wherever we go. You know, the truth is, earlier this summer, 
I had the opportunity to take a vacation and got to go up and see some family in Boise, Idaho. We went up there because we thought we'd get a break from the heat of this Oklahoma summer. Well, the only break whenever we got up there was record-breaking temperatures. Temperatures in the upper 90s, which were definitely uncommon for that place and that time of the year. And so, God, there is no hiding from the sun's heat. Just as there is no hiding from God. We saw earlier this summer the book of Jonah. What did Jonah try to do whenever God gave him a message? He tried to run. He tried to hide. He went farther and farther down, farther and farther away from God. But no matter how far away he went, there was no hiding from God. And let me tell you, when he was in the depths of that sea, he was very thankful that there was no hiding from God. He was thankful that God had a Savior in that fish to bring him back so that he could do the work of the Lord. There is no hiding from the heat of the sun. So the first thing we've seen this morning is how God continues to reveal Himself in the sky. He continues to reveal Himself in the heavens. They continue to tell of the glory of God and their expanse declares the work of His hand. But next, we see the revelation of God in Scripture. There's a a change going into verse 7. This is where we get more specific revelation about God. Who He is, what is His plan, and so much more. So in verses 7 through 11, we're going to see the revelation of God in the Scripture. And as I said, there's a transition, there's a change here. In the verse 1, it says, The heavens are telling of the glory of God. And the word used there is El. It means a mighty one. It doesn't tell us specifically who this God is. But David's going to get very specific. In the next three verses, we're going to see six times that he calls this God Lord. It's capital L-O, capital L, capital L-O, capital R, capital D, which is Yahweh, which is the personal name of God. And so we see that the God that is in control of all situations, the God that created the heavens and the earth, the God who holds everything into place is none other than Yahweh. He is the covenant God of the nation of Israel. He is the God who set apart His special people. He is the God who gave the law. He is the God through whom He gave these specific people, through whom the Scriptures came. He is the God who through His specific people, that He sent His Son into the world. You see, in the next few verses, we're also going to see six titles given to the Bible or the Word of God. They are law, testimony, precepts, commandment, fear, and judgments. He These are different aspects of the law. But I don't think that we should look at this psalm with that limited viewpoint as much of the Bible had not been written at this point in time. As the psalms were just now being written. Many of the prophets were yet to be born. And the New Testament, they had no idea what that is or who the church is. And so we look at this from the viewpoint of the entire Word of God. There are seven qualities given of the Word of God. They are perfect Sure, right, pure, clean, true, and righteous. Just as the Word of God encompasses all of these qualities, so too does the Lord Himself. We know that the Word of God encompasses all of these qualities because the Word of God is, as it says in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, it is inspired, it is God-breathed. We're not going to have time to go into those six different aspects or the seven different qualities given of the Word of God. But what we are going to look at in these next few verses are the seven things that God's Word can do to us. We're going to see that it restores us. It makes us wise. It gives us joy. It enlightens our eyes. It is our enduring hope. It warns us and it tells us that if we apply the truths and principles found in God's Word, there is reward. I think that's the key to this passage, as with every part of the Word of God. It's not about what it says, but it's what it can do to you. How can it change you to be 
who you are and who God has made you to be. The key is application. When reading the Word of God, many times we want to go to the Word of God and we want something from it. We want to see what it can do for us, how it can get us out of a situation. But the truth is when we go to God's Word, it's not about what it can do for us, but what it can do to us. How can it change us to be more like His Son, Jesus Christ, to make us more like its author, God the Father. The key is always application. So let's begin by looking at verse 7 and see what the Word of God can do to us. It says in verse 7, The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. So the first thing we see that the Word of God will do to us is it restores the soul. Restoring the soul has the idea of refreshing, of encouraging us. And the truth is, that's what the Word of God does. You know, I start each and every morning, I want to get up, and the first thing I want to do is I want to take a shower, because it refreshes me. It, it gets me ready to go for the day. It wakes up my muscles. It keeps my joints from aching. And so I want to go and get my shower. The same is true of God's Word. It gives me refreshment. It gives me joy. It's where I know that whenever I look into His Word that I can make it through the day. It lets me see opportunities that are in front of me. It helps me forget my problems and my sorrows. So the first thing that the Word of God can do is it restores our soul. It refreshes us. It gets us ready for what God has in store for our lives. The second thing is found there as well, and it says... It makes us wise. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. You know, there are a lot of brilliant people with very high IQs who make some very poor decisions. Some of those are those astrologers and scientists who say that there is no God. That's foolish. Wisdom comes from the Word of God. We get wisdom as we look at God's Word and not just look at it, but that we study it. That we read it with heart, with passion, with soul. And we make application in our lives. It's not about how brilliant you are. It says there, making wise the simple. Simple people can make wise decisions if you make them based on the Word of God. If you live your life based on the Word of God. Verse 8 goes on and says, The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. So the third thing we see is it rejoices our heart. You know, happiness comes from the happenings that are going on around us. We have, we're happy, we're sad, based on our current situation. But if we go to the Word of God, it gives us joy. It rejoices our heart. Because we're not focused on the temporal, the things of this world but we're focused on the eternal. We're focused on how the, the book ends. We know that we'll have a home in heaven, that we will be with Him for all eternity. And that's what brings us joy. The Word of God rejoices our heart. The fourth thing that it does is also found in verse 8, and it says, The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Our eyes are what we use to guide our path. And the Word of God enlightens our eyes. It gives us bright eyes. You know, there's a great verse that I love to pray before I read the Word of God. And it's found in Psalm 119.18. You might want to write that down. Psalm 119.18. And that verse says, Open my eyes that I may behold wonderful things from your law. That's what we want whenever we go to the Word of God. We want our eyes to be open, not our physical eyes, but our spiritual eyes, so that we can behold the wonderful things from His Word. Because from His Word is how we find the way that we should go, the way that we should live. Psalm 119, 105 says, Your Word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. We get to see the way to go when we look into God's Word. It shows us the way we should go. But you can also tell a lot about a person whenever you look into their eyes. Are they glazed over? Are they bloodshot? Those are not good signs. And that's not what the Word of God gives us. It enlightens our eyes. It gives us bright eyes. 
Eyes that see the good in other people. Eyes that show spiritual and physical health. Eyes that do good to others. And they not only see the good in others, but they look for others and see what we can do for them. They're not internally focused, they're externally focused. We get bright eyes from the Word of God. Look on with me to verse 9 as we see the next thing. It says, The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold, than much fine gold, sweeter than the honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. So the fifth thing we see that the Word of God does for us is it gives us enduring hope. No matter what happens here on this world, we know that three things will exist forever. They are God, His Word, and His people. Those are what we are to be focusing on. That's where we get our joy. And whenever we go to the Word of God, that's where we get our enduring hope that we know how this is going to turn out. As believers, we are to desire the Word over the things of this world. But many of us do the opposite. We want the latest, the greatest, the fastest, the newest things that are out there. We spend all of our time, our effort, our energy in getting those things. And then just a year later, they're worth little to no value at all. The Word of God is enduring. It is lasting forever. It should be more desirable to us than gold, than much fine gold. Sweeter than the drip drippings of the honeycomb. Is that how we see God's Word? Do we see it as something that is more important to us than the things of this world? Do we spend more time in God's Word than we do acquiring the things of this world? We should. By studying God's Word, we'll find the two final things that we see that the Word of God will do to us. In verse 11, it says, Moreover, by them your servant is warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. So the sixth thing we see is that the Word of God, it warns us. 2 Timothy 3.16, it begins, All Scripture is inspired by God. That means it's God-breathed. That's how it can be sure, perfect, true, righteous, altogether as we saw in these verses. It's inspired by God, but it's also profitable. And it says it's profitable for four things. For teaching. It teaches us doctrinal truth. It teaches us about salvation, about the Christian life, about that eternal hope that we have about Jesus Christ coming back to take us away. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You find that teaching of truth in His Word. Teaching, then it says reproof. And that's where it warns us. It shows us where we're off the path that we are supposed to be. But it also gives us correction. It shows us how to get right. And then training in righteousness. It shows us how to stay right. The Bible warns us. And it is up to us whether we're going to heed its warning or not. If we do not heed its warning, when Jesus Christ comes back, yes, we will be with Him for all eternity. But if we don't heed the, the warnings of God's word and live righteously and godly in this present age, whenever he comes back, the Bible says that we'll be ashamed at his coming. We don't want that. What we want to do is heed the warnings of God's word. We want to live righteously and godly so that we can receive the final thing that the word of God gives to us. And that is great reward. The end of verse 7 says, in keeping them, there is great reward. We spent several weeks this summer in our grow groups looking at eternal rewards. And we answered many of the questions about eternal rewards. Like, should we desire rewards? 1 Corinthians 9.24 says, run the race to get the prize. How do we gain rewards? We said, it's not by the amount of time that you serve God here on this earth. It's based on your faithfulness. 1 Corinthians 4.2, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found faithful. Where will we, the church, receive our rewards? 2 Corinthians 5.10 tells us that we'll receive our rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. That each and every one of us will stand there individually before Him and give an account of our lives based on what we've done here on this earth. We will be rewarded. We'll be recompensed, paid back for the things that we have done. The reward is not eternal life. The reward is crowns. The reward 
is a place of service where we will serve Him not only back here on this earth during that thousand year reign, but where we will serve Him for all eternity in the new heavens and the new earth. That's the kind of life we are wanting to live. We are wanting to live so that we hear Him say, well done, good and faithful servant, a life that is well rewarded. That's a lot of information packed into five verses. We just only keyed in on the seven things that God's Word can do to us. But there's so much more. Those six qualities and those seven um, things that God's Word that shows and reveals God's character. But we saw the seven things that it can do to us. And that is restore us, make us wise, give us joy, enlighten our eyes. It is our enduring hope. It warns us and it tells us of God's reward. Do you want a place to start studying God's Word so that you can reap the benefits, so that you can be changed to be more like Christ? Psalm 19 would be a great place to start because there's so much more in that chapter than we've even had time to even scratch the surface of, just in those five verses as well. But let's take just a few minutes to finish up this chapter. And we see the response, the response to the revelation in verses 12 through 14. I believe this is where David is praying for three things. And those three things are purification, prevention, and perfection. Look with me at verse 12 as we look at purification. He says, Who can discern his errors and acquit me of hidden faults? There are times whenever we sin and we don't realize that what we're doing is sin. He says, Who can acquit me of these hidden faults? You know, the truth is, is found in 1 John 1 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us. Forgive us of the ones we confessed, but He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So, whenever we do something, we sin, we don't even realize it, we may not even know that it's sin, God forgives us of all of our sins. It's God who can equip me of those hidden faults. He wants to be pure. He wants to stand before God. He wants to be faithful in His service to Him. And He knows the first way to do that is to be in fellowship with His heavenly Father. And so He wants His sins acquitted. But look on in verse 13. He wants prevention. He says, Also, keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not rule over me. Then I will be blameless and I shall be acquitted of great transgression. Also, keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. These are the sins that we willingly and knowingly do on purpose. We know that what we're about to do is wrong, but we say, you know what? There's old 1 John 1, 9. I'm going to do it, and I know that God will forgive me. And you know what? I don't think anybody else will know. There won't be any harm in it. No harm, no foul. He'll forgive me. Everything will be okay. But that's not what David's prayer is. He says, keep me, keep me back from presumptuous sins. Let them not rule over me. Many times those sins are the things that rule over us. They are the things that guide our life. He says, don't allow them to guide my life. Then I'll be blameless and I shall be acquitted of the great transgression. You say, man, that's a hard life to live. And it is. But... He's striving for more than just that. And we see what he's striving for in verse 14. His prayer there is for perfection. He says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So he's striving for perfection. We talked about last week in our grow groups. That what is the goal for our life? We know, we talk about it here all the time. What is our purpose? Our purpose is to make disciples. But what's the goal for our individual lives? We said it goes back to Romans 8, 29. That we want to be conformed to the image of Christ. We want to be like Christ in every aspect of our lives. We looked at several verses and we said that we are to love as Christ loved us. We are to forgive others as Christ forgave us. He says, I want not only the words that come out of my mouth, but the meditation of my heart, my thoughts, to be acceptable in your sight. You know, the truth is, whether or not we want Him to, He knows our thoughts, He knows our intentions, He knows the words that are going to be coming out of our mouth. 
but we want them to be acceptable in his sight. This has the idea that our words and, our, and the meditations of our heart are pleasing, are acceptable as a sacrifice. What kind of a sacrifice did you bring to the altar? Was it the old heifer that was about to die? No, you brought the stud. You brought the bull. You brought the lamb that was out without blemish or spot. You brought the perfect sacrifice. And that's the life that David is looking for in his life. He says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable. You say, man, that's more than I can strive for. How could I ever live that life? I've got 1 John 1, 9. That's how I live my life. We can live that life because of what it says in the next two, or the very end of that verse. And it says, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. He is our rock. He is our foundation. He is our redeemer. He is our champion. Our Lord is our strength. That's the way that we can live a Christ-like life. We don't live our life based off of 1 John 1, 9. We live our life based off of Romans chapter 6, where we understand that we've died and rose again with Christ to a new life. And we are to live out that life, that Christ-like life, that life that is perfect, that is pure, that is righteous, that is holy, that He gives us at the moment we place our faith in Him. If we are diligent to take time on a daily basis to get into God's Word and allow it to get a hold of us, we'll be changed. We'll be able to live a Christ-like life. Just reading the Word of God doesn't change us. We have to read it with heart, with passion, with purpose, and it will make us more like its author. So what have we seen this morning? we have seen that God continues to reveal Himself and make Himself known on a worldwide basis through the vastness, through the expanse of the sky. We see that He is in control and by the work of His hands as we look out into the skies. But we've also seen in His Word, we begin to learn more and more about who that God is. We find specific characteristics that He and His Word hold and we see what His Word can do to us. And finally, we saw the response, purification, prevention, and perfection. So let's think about some applications. Number one is, let us take time to see God's glory as it's revealed in the sky. Remember, that is a universal language. We see that God is in control whenever we see how God holds everything in its right place. That it spins at the right moment. That as the sky is out there and the clouds move through the, the sky, we get to see that God is in control. Take time to stop and smell the roses. Take time to look at the beauty and the glory that God has in the sky. Number two is let us take time to see God's glory as it's revealed in Scripture. That's where we find the specifics about who God is. We get to see who He is. What is His plan? How did he fulfill his plan? How do we have eternal life? How do we live the Christian life? We find all of those things in his word, in his written word. It's life changing if we'll get into it and allow it to change our lives. The third thing is, is let us respond by letting the words of our mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to our Lord. I challenge you to memorize this verse. This verse, if you'll memorize it, you'll put it in your mind and it becomes a part of you. It will change who you are because we know that God knows the, the meditations of our heart. He knows the words that are going to come out of our mouths. But if we want to be like Him, we need to be cognizant of that at all times. If we memorize that verse and we say it throughout the day, whenever things come up, wrong thoughts, wrong actions come up in our lives, then that verse sneaks into our mind and it reminds us that that's not the way I want to be. I want to live for perfection. I want to live for Jesus Christ. I want to be, as Romans 8, 29 says, to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. So let the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be pleasing to God. 